Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. The first instance of spiritual warfare recorded in the Bible is an encounter between a woman and the devil. And on the heels of that ill-fated meeting, God decreed that the woman and her offspring would oppose the evil one forever. The role of women in society and in the churches, even today, hotly debated. In Women, God's Secret Weapon, Ed Sovoso <coughs> declares Christians everywhere, men and women, to battle against the kingdom's true enemy, Satan. In this edition, which includes a brand new study guide, Ed persuasively pre presents the Bible's portrayal of women as powerful adversaries of the devil. Here is inspiration for men and women to work together for the evil one's defeat. Ed Sovoso, founder and president of Harvest Evangel Evangelism and also of the International Transformation Network, is widely recognized as a mission strategist and solid Bible teacher who specializes in city reaching, marketplace transformation, and gender reconciliation. He's the author of the best-selling books, Anointed for Business, That None Shall Perish, and the original release of Women, God's Secret Weapon. Initially trained in business, his background includes banking, hospital administration, and financial services. Here to talk about the revised and updated edition of Women, God's Secret Weapon is Ed Silvoso. Ed, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. It's a pleasure to be with you, Rabbi, a real pleasure. Well, it, it was a pleasure when you and I first met uh, almost three years ago when uh, we released Ecclesia, and uh, you released it on this program, and we had a very dynamic, uh, very spirit-filled conversation about the realities of what the church was called to be. And we're, here we are again talking about something that is at the crossroads of controversy, a crossroads of misunderstanding, at a crossroads of deliberation where denominational Christianity has held a line which is not necessarily lined up with the gospel, not necessarily lined up with what God ordained. Uh, I don't believe that there's anywhere which says that a woman is not an image bearer of God in any other way than I too am an image bearer of God and there, the, therefore the distinction uh, is man-made not God-made if we take a look at the true image bearing description of the testimony of God in Genesis. So we've gotten to a point where we look at the narrative and uh, we have confused ourselves. And you have uh, 10 years after the release of this book, it is probably more timely today than it was when it was originally released. And you've added so much more to it to make it more relevant. Uh, how did we get so far astray from this idea that men and women are image bearers of God and in fact, the encounter with the woman in the garden is a false narrative. It begins with a question that the answer to is a one-word answer. And the question was, did God really tell you that you could not eat from the tree of life? The true answer is no. Because God did not speak to Eve. God spoke to Adam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He gave the instruction to Adam. Mm -hmm. We do not see anywhere in Scripture where God had that conversation with Eve. But in this deception, in this human condition that we're in, we tend to want to give an answer without weighing the question. That then opens up an avenue of confusion, and that's where we tend to go astray. So as you look at that encounter, this was the first one on the front line was a woman. Was she put there to be a sacrificial lamb to be slaughtered? 
Not at all. And, and, and if you go back to that passage, Rabbi, the devil exaggerated. He says, so God told you that you cannot eat of any tree, you know? No, God didn't say that. He told them about the tree of life. And like you said, he told that to Adam. And so we have to put it in context. The Bible begins with God creating man and woman and bringing them together and the devil is splitting that and the bible closes with christ marrying his bride the church so that the whole bible is an epic to the reconciliation of men and women unfortunately as you hinted at the church hasn't been up to speed and we have cooperated, you know, with the demeaning of women, you know, historically. We haven't helped there. So when I wrote the book, I wrote it not to favor women over men, but to highlight that the best thing that can happen to a man and a woman is to walk together in harmony. And when they do, they reflect the image of God on earth. This whole concept goes back to something that uh, we, we seem to have lost in the translation. Uh, we, uh, in the Old Testament, women were treated as <coughs> chattel. Yep. Uh, <coughs> there was this <coughs> excuse me, uh, cultural entitlement. Uh, there was a blessing which was to go forth and replenish the earth, meaning have children. Uh, so the number of wives was not limited because you needed, uh, you couldn't just have four and replenish the earth. You needed 16, you needed 24, you needed many to fill the earth. But when God then came and set a people apart, he established certain restrictions on these matters, but he did not make the woman subservient. Not at all. In fact, he told Adam, when, he, when God created Adam, he looked at Adam and he said, it's no good. Not because what he did was no good, but because he lacked the proper help. And it's fascinating, and I bring that up in the book that on that day God created the animals and he says it is good. He created Adam and he says it's not good because he is incomplete. And that's why the creation of Eve caused God to say at the end of the sixth day, which began good with the creation of animals, not good when man was created alone and very good when Eve was created, and they both walked together in harmony. It, and through history, Rabbi, as you know, because there is virtue in chastity, in purity, okay? And that was essential to the preservation of family. Unfortunately, historically, we developed a double standard. A man could be sexually immoral, and it was bad, but not terrible. A woman was sexually immoral, and that was the end of the story. But in the Bible, and you know this, you know, as a Jewish rabbi, of the 41 generations that are shown for Jesus, from Jesus, actually Joseph, all the way to Adam, Always the father is mentioned, except on four occasions when the wife is mentioned. And the four women that are mentioned are women with issues, right? Bethsabeth, Tamar, Elizabeth, you know? I mean, you have women that fail. Rahab, you know, the prostitute. Why will God place on Jesus' genealogy? something that we as human beings we will rather not talk about because he wanted to show that they were victims of a system and God 
enter into their victimhood to elevate them and to display them as ancestors of Jesus. You know, you bring up one of my, my most favorite points, and that is that um, even today, 2019, we still put on the billboard of the church, Sunday's message, Rahab the harlot, or Rahab the prostitute. But Rahab was the mother of Boaz. and yes. And... What woman would not want her Boaz? But yet they don't put on their profile saying that I want my mother-in-law to be a former prostitute. Uh, mm -hmm. And why have we not elevated Rahab to being on a par with Corey Ten Boom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She, she did many years before the Holocaust what Corey Ten Boom did that has given her great uh, honor and has given her great uh, notoriety, but Rahab is relegated to a prostitute when mm -hmm. she was the salvation, uh, the protector. Yeah. Uh, had they yeah. been discovered, uh, we would not have the Joshua and Caleb story. We would have none of that. Uh, we seem to be a people that want to latch on to that which serves our own personal needs, our own personal desires, and our own personal justification. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to women, this is how we have treated women over the generations because we say, well, it was Eve who was beguiled by Satan. It was actually Adam's responsibility as the head of the yeah. household. Uh, yeah. He was the one who ultimately was the responsible party. And a point that I make in the book at the very beginning, Rabbi, is that when God came down to the garden and he confronted the devil, he called the devil up and told him, I have a five-part punishment on you. Number one, you are demoted more than all the animals created. That hurt because he's a proud creature. Number two, I'm removing, this is the equivalent of removing the driver's license. You will no longer walk, you're going to crawl now. So he slowed him down. Number three, I'm ruining your diet. You will eat dust from now on. Those are severe punishment. You know, the motion is slowing him down, his diet. But this number four and number five were really hurt the devil. God threatened the devil, and I want every lady watching this to hear this, with the anger of the woman. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. We usually construct that to mean that God punished Eve with the anger of the devil. No, not at all. And then we move to number five, and it talks about the head of the devil being bruised. And that head is bruised by the woman and her seed. So that is such a redemptive sentence that God passed. And we men must understand that because we will never be fulfilled. No, we will reach our destiny until we walk in harmony with our wives primarily and with every woman in that sphere of influence. I am, because I am Jewish, an ordained rabbi, an ordained Baptist minister, um, Genesis 3.15 is the foundation of all things for me prophetically. <clears throat> um, it establishes two parts of a very perfect puzzle uh, that the church has taken one half of and spoken of, and that's Jesus, the seed of the woman. Uh, we've omitted any discussions about the seed of the serpent. Uh, we're going to end for a big shock when he appears because we know nothing about him because all we've become is Jesus only. But it also shows us the heart of God that the seed of the woman passes through the woman. 
it passes from generation to generation so that through an activation of the Holy Spirit, Miriam, who also <coughs> has her lineage to David, Joseph, who also has his lineage to David, both meet at a common point, and that common point then goes down to Jesse, to Boaz, to Rahab, and then straight down the narrow path all the way down to Adam and to Eve. As we look at this, we have so diminished the woman's <coughs> role in this. We've forgotten that Deborah, who we say, well, uh, you know, uh, there was nobody to do the job, so God uh, <coughs> relinquished. Uh, she, she, she was already seated at the time. She had already been appointed at the time. This was not, well, there's nobody to send uh, who's qualified. Uh, she was already seated and appointed. Uh, does that not establish God's respect for the role of the woman? Well, I list in my book, you know, women after woman that God used mightily. Without yes. those women, you know, Samuel's mother, you know, one of them, Deborah, they are real, real heroes all through the Bible. And they were not because God couldn't find a man and he had to settle for second best. You know, God loves women. And he, look at Jesus himself. He was supported financially. When he began to itinerate, you know, in Luke chapter 8, he could no longer support himself from his job because he was making trips outside of his hometown by women out of their own resources. Look at Mary Magdalene, look at Martha, look at Maria, look even at the adulterous woman. I mean, they wanted Jesus to pronounce judgment and he held back until everybody came under conviction. And he sent the husband back to their wives and the woman back to her, the, her husband. It's fascinating, Rabbi, to see how passionate God is about reconciling men and women. How passionate he is. And that's my prayer that everybody that is watching this will receive that because we will never be complete until we are walking in harmony with our husband or with our wife. You know, God blesses unity. He never blesses <clears throat> division. There's nowhere in the Bible does he bless a divided people. Matter of fact, he says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. For this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they will become one. The dividing of one which is the largest number in the Bible, uh, is uh, quite um, extraordinary um, uh, in, in the fact that uh, uh, we split the atom and we have a nuclear explosion. And that nuclear explosion destroys everything around it and makes it uninhabitable for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. We don't relate things of the natural to things of the supernatural. Therefore, when we divide husband and wives or they go about doing what it is they want to do and not in unity, and they wonder why God is not blessing it, God's message is a message that he blesses unity, not division, and that is unity between a man and a woman. And that is that marital agreement. King Solomon uses the cord of three strands. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you have been married for a long time, yes? Yes, 51 years. 51 years. Now, your cord of three strands, as I look at it today, may not be as beautiful. Uh, it may be wrapped in duct tape because over the years you had to patch this, you had to fix that. You had to work on this. It hasn't been a perfect, it's been a perfect marriage for you. You and your wife love each other, but you've had your ups and downs, your agreements and disagreements, yes? 
to a degree, yes. So, but but the, yeah, go ahead, for like, yeah. Uh, but that is the process. That is the process of how we we uh, live life and we grow together, and that is what makes the two unbreakable. What has helped us immensely, Rabbi, and I'm sure you know this, in the New Testament, God gave man a command and a promise. The promise is the same what he gave to women, but the command is different. He told men that we must love our wives the way that Christ loved the church. And if we do that, if she has any spot, any wrinkle, any stain, that's the promise. She will be made whole. So the command is love your wife. The promise is whatever is wrong with her, she will change. When it comes to women, God didn't tell the women, love your husband. He tells the women, honor your husband. And even those that are not obedient to the faith, they shall become obedient but they observe your conduct. And I have found, Rabbi, that that brings so much protection because God is telling us, if you love your wife and your wife is not doing the right thing, your love will cause her to change. And he tells the woman, if you honor your husband and he's disobedient, he will change. Nowadays, when a couple runs into trouble, we say, well, you know, unless both agree on how to fix the problem, the problem cannot be fixed. I respectfully disagree with that. If a husband loves his wife the way Christ loved the church, the Bible says she will change. The problem is, what does it mean to love? For us, man has a lot to do with sexual relationships, with protection, with providing, but actually it says, give yourself to your wife, the way Christ gave himself to the church. So my question is, where was the church when Christ gave himself for her? He was spitting at him. He was shouting, crucify. He was pointing a finger. And look how Jesus, believing the power of love, that when the future church was cursing him, he was blessing them. And that's what I tell husbands. It doesn't matter what your wife does wrong. Love her by giving yourself to her. We husbands equate love with giving things. Our wives equate love with giving ourselves. The woman in Proverbs 31, her husband entrusted his heart to her. Not just his finances, not just the household, but his heart. So my exhortation to myself and to every man is, have you given your heart to your wife? Are you vulnerable with her? Every night, uh, Rabbi, after we turn off the lights, I reach for the hand of Ruth, my wife, and I put it on my heart, and I ask her to pray for me. And every morning before we turn the lights back on, I do the same. Why? Because the most vulnerable thing in the heart of a man, uh, in, in a man, is his heart. People of our generation, Rabbi, we have been taught to suppress our emotions. Men don't cry, be a man, don't be a girl. I mean, you broke your leg, keep playing and win the game, we'll talk later, we suppress. I can tell you with absolute transparency, Rabbi, I have learned so much about my wife by listening to her, praying for me every night and every morning. And that hand on my heart protects me so much, and we are in deeper love today than we were 51 years ago when we stood at the altar to commit ourselves to each other. 
Well, it is obvious because God's hand of blessing has been on you that you've honored the single and first assignment he gave you, and that yes. was to shepherd the heart of your wife. And the way yes. you shepherd the heart of a wife is you tenderly hold it in your hand, <clears throat> and you do not set it on the shelf, you do not drop it on the ground, you do not step on it, but you respect it and you honor it. It says, husbands love your wives, and in that same admonition, we take a look at uh, Paul's letter that says, Let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth, only that which is for the betterment, the uplifting, and the encouragement. So we need to be speaking words of encouragement to our wives and to the women, our children, our daughters, so that they know that the standard of love is a standard of respect. Oh, yes, Ephesians 6 tell, tells you wives respect your husbands, but it starts with the husband. Starts with the husband's instruction. Husbands, love your wives. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. If husbands will love their wives okay, the way that Christ loved the church. Right. Love the church. Right. Yeah. Right. Re respect is a natural, a natural out outcropping, and you won't have to fight for... Uh, leadership and so um, we have to look at this model of if, if I make on that uh, rabbi yes so you quoted Ephesians 6 but let's go to first Peter you know chapter 3 where women are told to honor their husbands okay um, um, you know, to honor their husbands so that those that are disobedient to the word will become obedient to the word as they observe their chaste behavior. Unfortunately, chapter divisions throw us off because there is talking about Sarah. She was called Sarai. And what did Abraham do when he became disobedient? He told Sarai to lie about the relationship, remember? Yes. Because he was afraid that not one, but two kings will kill him. Sarah honored Abraham by not telling on him until God intervened and delivered her, and then she was blessed with lots of jewelry and things like that. I would like every woman listening to our conversation, Rabbi, to realize the power that there is in honoring somebody who doesn't deserve to be honored because we are honoring him as son to the Lord. We are blessing him not because he deserves to be blessed, but because we have the power to bless. And when the husband gives himself to his wife and loves her unconditionally and the wife honors the husband even when he doesn't deserve it the word of God states that the one who is wrong changes and that is the message we need today Rabbi absolutely absolutely and this is just <clears throat> one of many messages that you will learn and glean from Ed Savosa's revised uh, and updated edition, including a study guide of women, God's secret weapon, God's inspiring message to women of power, purpose, and destiny. Men, you have the greatest gift ever created by God, who took out of your very self, a part of yourself, to be there to help you, to come alongside of you to be there to make almost two of you to double your impact on this earth by creating two image bearers. You see, you were created as an image bearer, and from you the image bearer was created another image bearer. No lesser, no greater than the creation that he did in you. And God wants you to see an inventory, the beauty, to esteem the other more than yourself to look out for the interest, to listen with a careful ear, but not with the ear <clears throat> of your ear, but with the ear of your heart. He wants you to bend the knee of your heart before him so that he can reach you and tell you how to better 
be a minister to your wife, a better counselor to your wife, a better support to your wife, to realize that without her, it is like taking your body and cutting it in two. Half of you can accomplish nothing, but all of you can accomplish anything because with God, all things are possible. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue in our conversation with Ed Savoso, author of Woman, God's Secret Weapon, God's Inspiring Message to Women of Power, Purpose, and Destiny. We'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Ed Savoso, author of the revised and updated edition of Women, God's Secret Weapon. Ed, welcome back to the program. A pleasure to be with you, Rabbi. Well, Ed, it's, uh, it's, it's our joy. You know, one of the things I was fascinated about the book uh, was uh, the way you... Um, combine the lesson in each chapter, and each chapter is uh, extraordinarily rich. Uh, I'll take just one example. Um, uh, chapter 3, God's Trusted Partners. Women have yeah. not been relegated, and you have a message right in the title. Women have not been relegated to post as mere privates in God's army. Indeed, they have been chosen as key players. The biblical record shows that from Rahab to Mary to Priscilla, God has used women to transform cities, 
regions, and the world. I think back to the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Here is Jesus. He's in a place that <clears throat> technically our people are not supposed to be. He's mm -hmm. there by himself in a place which is a gathering place of women and Samaritan women which were half Jewish and not. And so it was taboo. And yet one woman approaches and he is there for a divine appointment. And he has a conversation with her. And she is so excited that she goes back. And at the voice of a woman, she brings revival, the very first New Testament revival of record. An entire city mm -hmm. comes out. An entire city mm -hmm. gets saved. This has not happened since Jonah and Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it happens at the voice of a Samaritan woman. And yet mm -hmm. we have denominations arguing whether a woman should be allowed to speak. <laughs> My test always is if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how do we look at these situations and circumstances and, and make sense of uh, what God is um, uh, really trying to convey to us? Well, I think the devil knows that God really established a sentence that, you know, the seed of the woman, which is then just Jesus, you know, is the descendants of Eve you know, will bruise him on the head. And he's afraid of that, Rabbi. And that's why he has diminished women and some pseudo-theologians have helped him. What I did in the book, I took every passage used to forbid women from preaching, from teaching, from exercising leadership. And I believe that in a convincing way, I demonstrated that those passages meant the exact opposite. You know, when we take that well-known passage, for I do not permit the woman to teach, but to be taught at home in all quiet and in submission. Okay, we say, look, Paul really, really demoted her. No. How were men taught in those days? At home, quietly, in submission. He elevated them. When the Bible says that the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the believing wife and vice versa, when the Bible states that the husband doesn't have a right to his body, but the wife and vice versa, so that Jesus was a champion, not of women, of reconciliation. But if I may comment on it, uh, Rabbi, the key, and you mentioned earlier on in the previous segment, is love and that respect that leads to love. What I teach, and you know this, but it will be good for our audience, to have a meaningful, fulfilling marriage, you need three expressions of love. The way that a cord of three uh, strands, right, is not easily broken. So what I teach is that, first of all, you need the love of God, agape. Without yes. that, you will never reach it. Then you need feel your love, where you can become friends. And then you need the sexual attraction, which is known as eros love. Now, this is the interesting thing, Rabbi. We get agape love at the 100% strength, and it never diminishes because God is so faithful. He's always there for us. We cannot improve on that. We get erotic love that's very glandular and that comes with puberty. It usually reaches its height in our late teens, but with years it comes down and down. There's some medical uh, and 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 some medication, you may stretch it a little bit, but that will come down eventually, and there is not, not much you can do about it. 
So we cannot improve on agape love. We cannot be paying the path of erotic love. But the only love that we can really cultivate is filial love, to be friends. And I believe, Rabbi, that that's what Jesus had in mind when he quoted that we must become one, not only physically, but in friendship, in relationship. And I would like to tell everybody watching this, you can always cultivate your friendship with your spouse. And the more you know him or her, the more fulfilling your sex life will be, the more meaningful your spiritual life will be. Because of the three strands, the only one that we can manage is the filial love. The other two, one is given, you can never take it away, the other one will decrease with time. When you talk about that, the bond between a man and a woman with God there in the center uh, <clears throat> is quite an interesting theological paradigm. It says when two pray together, whatever they pray touching in agreement shall come to pass. Mm -hmm. So theologically, if a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they will become one, are they actually two people praying together or are they one person praying together? No, I believe they are two people in unity, right? Uh, yes. <clears throat> in unity. Yes. See, I've had people argue with me and say, well, if I pray with my wife and we're one, that's just one person, and so we're not seeing that. I said, no, I think you have this unity understanding yeah. wrong. You, you are still too independent, too, and you have different gifts. And the reason why God has, if, 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 if this was done of God's choosing and God's anointing, then he's going to use her gifts and your gifts together to make yeah. one more powerful entity than you could ever be without each other. You are each other's magnifier as yes. opposed to an edifier, as opposed to each other's counterpart. Uh, it's nice to say, where I am weak, she is strong. But it's even better to say, where I am weak, she magnifies. And where yeah. I am strong, she magnifies. And she fulfills. Yeah. And she creates <coughs> this wonderful relationship. Uh, so when God said it was not good for the man to be alone, and we now have uh, chronologically from the Jewish calendar 5,000 880 years which we've chronicled since those words were spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, since the sixth day of creation, we looked at the, coming up on the new year, 5,880 right. years. Uh, why don't men get it? Uh, it, it I've actually sat in counseling sessions with men saying, okay, here's the bottom line. Would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Because they can be right and so, and so alienating. They can be yep. right and so off-putting. They can be right yep. and so divisive. They can be right yep. at the expense of their wife. Yeah, yeah. What I have found, Rabbi, and this is our own journey, and I'm speaking now of my own brokenness and the mercy of the Lord shown to Ruth and I. What I have failed in the early years of my marriage was in empathizing. Mm. You see, empathy is what women crave for. <clears throat> Usually, they share a problem. And what do we do? We give them the solution. And that offends them because they feel like idiots. How I couldn't figure it. 
So what I'm learning, and I continue to learn, I pray, is that when my wife shares a problem or a feeling or an opinion, I can first empathize with her, feel her pain, feel where she's coming from, you know, connect at the heart level and then move to the mind level or else, like you said, Rabbi, we're going to be right but very unhappy because what the wife desires the most is to be loved the way she is so that when the two of us connect at that level, now she can rise up to become everything that God wanted her to become and so do we as men. I remember in our younger years, Rabbi, I noticed, uh, because I believe that filial love, friendship, is the glue that holds the channels, you know, for agape love and for erotic love. And we got to a point where with four kids and a household full of guests and a ministry expanding, when we first got married, I mean, this was our marriage and this was the two of us, very close. Twenty years later, we are still here, but separated by so many things. <clears throat> she wanted to talk at night. I wanted to talk in the morning. When <laughs> I went to bed at night, I didn't want to talk uh, about things that, in my opinion, we already discussed. And in the morning, when I was fresh like a cucumber, ready to talk, she didn't want to talk. And then I said, Lord, I am a minister. I don't want my marriage to fail. I don't want it to wither. What am I doing wrong? What should I do better? And the Lord took me to that verse that says that we husbands must live with them with understanding, you know, with empathy. And then as I went to the Lord and said, Lord, help me, what did I miss? The Lord took me back to a conversation we had more than once where my wife shared a traumatic experience she had growing up. And I miss it because as a typical male, I said, okay, and so what? And I move on. And then I understood why the night she wanted to extend it and the morning she wanted to avoid it. And then I made the decision, Rabbi, that for a Latino, macho, I mean, exuding testosterone was very, very hard to make. I said, honey, you marry me because I am a multitasker. I'm a hardworking person. When I leave the house, I come back with the bacon. If I change that, you will not love me anymore because you love that part of me. But I realized that being a multitasker, and here we are 20 years later, things are not working as romantically well as when we first met. So I made this decision, Rabbi. I offered my wife, I promise her. First of all, that was before cell phones, to buy an answering machine, because the phone will ring and I will run to it. No, I will not answer it, and I will bring you breakfast in bed every morning. She said, sure, sure. So the next day, okay, I already have the answering machine, no interruption. I fix breakfast, I put it on a tray, I put a rose there, I feel, oh, she's going to melt, right? So I walk into the bedroom, I show her what I prepare. She looks at me very skeptical, like saying, what's the trick? <laughs> what's the trick? And there was no trick. But for six months, I did that faithfully, Rabbi. I brought the breakfast because I told my wife, I cannot tell you how the day will go because I'm an entrepreneur. But I can pledge to you that you will always know how the day will begin. And by giving her my breakfast time, I gave her the best because I used to have a breakfast at 6 o'clock in this restaurant. Another breakfast at seven across the street, and the third breakfast back to the original restaurant at eight o'clock. And what that did, Rabbi, it conveyed to my wife 
that that half hour I am totally hers. Today, 30 years after that, we fight to see who will bring the other breakfast in bed. And here you have an aged man like me enjoying breakfast in bed occasionally because 30 years ago I decided to empathize with my wife, to live with her in an understanding way. And the real reward, Rabbi, is that our four daughters have their husband bring them breakfast in bed. And now that is going on to our grandkids. So I would like to encourage everybody, when you give yourself to your wife, you give her what she's longing for, what she's desperate for. She wants to know, do I have your heart, or I just have your mind, or your billfold with the money, or the roof over my head? If they know that they have our heart, everything else will flow out of that. Ed, you have just answered the question for all men, that you who desire a Proverbs 31 wife must be a Proverbs 31 man. You must put yourself in a position where you esteem your wife so she feels esteemed, so that you've raised your children in an environment that they call her blessed because they saw their father call her blessed because they saw an example of him lifting her up and that he became successful and she became successful and they enjoyed the fruits of each other's labor. They were not in competition, but they were in love and they cared for one another. And we don't have this great description of a Proverbs 31 man, but we look at the life of Job and we kind of get a glimpse of the faithfulness of one who was put in a position where he was faithful to God and ultimately what was lost, not in its exact replacement, but was restored to him because of his faithfulness. God requires faithfulness. Wives require devotion, faithfulness, and attention, and it is ultimately so important and it is the core of the message of why one women matter in ministry women have a voice they have they have gifts of discernment that you and i wish we had we wish we could have heard what they just heard because we heard somebody say something but makes no it doesn't bother us at all and they grab us by the sleeve and they pull us to the side and say, did you hear what he just said? And you go, yeah, yeah, I heard it. It didn't bother me at all. Didn't bother you at all. Well, here's what he just said to you and go, oh, 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 oh. now you see, I have my protector, my defender. She has yeah. a role. She has a place because of her sensitivities and the way God created her. And we need to revisit this subject. We need to get out of doctrine. We need to get out of theology. We need to see how God used women, and we need to do the same. First, at home with our wives and with our daughters, and prepare them for what is to come, and to raise our sons to become husbands and fathers, to raise our daughters to become mothers and wives, and to understand that women are God's secret weapon. And the answers are contained in this book. Ed Silvoso, God, women, God's secret weapon, God's inspiring message to women of power, purpose, and destiny. With a Bible study, husbands and wives do this together and do what it says. And you can be sitting 51 years later like Ed Silvoso saying, I'm just in lo- more in love with my wife today than I was the day I married her. And we are inseparable because we have become one. Ed Savoso, thank you for taking the time. I know how busy you are. May God bless you and all the works of your hands. May God bless you, Rabbi. May God bless everybody watching this broadcast. God bless you. Thank Thank you you. very much. Thank you. I hope hope to see you again soon, my friend. 
We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.